Good evening, my dear fiends. Good evening, and welcome to Monster Movie Night. I am your creepy old curator of Gargoyle Manor, the Monster Museum, and your host, along with my co-host, Boris T. Buzzard. <laughs> welcome, welcome, one and all. <laughs> I'm so glad to see you here again, eh, Boris? <laughs> We're always so glad to see new blood as well as old blood. <laughs> well, my dear fiends, are you ready to put up a chill up under your flesh and raise those goose bumpy or goose fleshy feet? Feelings that goes from the back of the neck all the way down. <laughs> well, my dear fiend Boris has picked a wonderful film for you tonight then. One that will be sure to put the creep back into your own creepy little lives. <laughs> it's called The Creeping Flesh, starring our own creep himself, our wonderful actor, the one and only Peter Cushing, along with Sir Christopher Lee. Two creeps for the price of one, eh, my dear fiends? <laughs> and if you count Boris and I, you get four. So that's more bang for your bucks, or should I say more creep for your bucks, eh? <laughs> so let me turn right around here. We'll key it into the old internet haunted keyboard, and that will be The Creeping Flesh, starring Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing. <laughs> excellent, excellent, excellent. Now, let's go right down here and tune in the old haunted internet TV, and then we'll go right up to the old internet haunted projector. Ah, it's a technological age, my dear fiends. Hey, Boris. <laughs> Did your mama tell you not to turn on the TV at night? No, she didn't. And neither did yours. <laughs> I've been watching you. <laughs> Indeed. So, let's go right here <laughs> and turn it on and start the show. <laughs> I've been watching you.
Come in. A gentleman to see you, Professor. Uh, you have come to help me? Uh, sit down, sit down. I must talk to somebody. Nobody will listen to me. I must have help with my researches. Of course. Even now it may be too late. Too late, do you understand? There is so much to do. Mm. I must have a qualified doctor to assist me. You, uh, you are a qualified doctor. I asked for a qualified doctor. Yes, of course. Mm. My work is of the utmost importance for the survival of the human race. Do you believe in evil, Doctor? I, I do not mean evil as it is commonly understood. I mean the existence of evil as a living organism, as a plague, a disease which infects humanity like, like cholera or typhoid, an epidemic slowly spreading until it affects the, the whole world. Evil is a disease. A disease which can be prevented or cured, like many others. Come, come, I will show you. Please. There. You are looking at the very essence of evil itself. The isolated bacillus of the most deadly plague of all. But you see, you see with your own eyes, they all see, yet nobody believes. You must believe me. I alone have looked into the face of evil. I alone possess the knowledge of how to combat this, this terrible force which I stand guilty of unleashing upon the world 3,000 years ahead of its appointed time. <sighs> Some people even say that I am mad. Everything is here. Everything is documented. I am a scientist, not a madman. Three years ago, I had just returned from New Guinea, where I'd been searching for the remains of primitive man. I brought back with me what I thought would be the most sensational scientific discovery of the century, the complete skeleton of a primitive man, which would revolutionize our ideas of the origin of our species. Right, start one load. Oh, no. Emily! Penelope, my dear, dear child. Oh, how good to see you again. <laughs> Let me look at my little girl. Yes, I do declare. I do declare you've grown taller. Oh, it's good to see you again. So very good and so good to be home. Everything the same. Why, even to Martha. Martha, how are you? It's Emily, Father. Emily? Oh, yes, 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 of course. How stupid of me. Emily, nice to see you. Welcome home, sir. Thank you. See you, Emily. Yes. Water oh, my old friend. Welcome home, Professor, and well timed. I'm just concluding the final experiment which you suggested in your last letter. Good, good. We have a lot to talk about and much, much to do. Hey, be, be careful, please. That way. Waterloo, take them through to the laboratory, will you? I'll join you immediately. Yes, but take care, please. Whatever you do, don't stand it upright. Keep it horizontal. Oh, no, it's very, very right. delicate. Excuse me, my dear. I must just check with if this specimen has survived the journey intact. Careful. By the way, what, what did happen to Martha and the other servants? I'll explain it all at breakfast. Well, you will be taking breakfast with me, won't you, Father? Oh, yes, yes, of course. We also have a lot to talk about. Give me just a few minutes and I'll be with you. Yes. Put it, put it over there. Ah, careful, don't hit the table with the experiment. Oh, yeah. That's right. Over there. Let me just clear the things off the top. Here we go. Yeah, must be worth a few words. What a love. I've done it. I found it. This is it, my friend. Uh, this will change everything. We'll have university fellowships. Uh, Why, we'll write books. Uh, might even win the Richter Prize. Uh, Richter Prize, ten thousand uh, pounds. Why, you can have a better laboratory, new equipment. I could double your salary. And it's not only us who will benefit, but the whole world. Yes. Oh, thank you very much. Come on. Come on. Old skin flint. Oh. 
Him and his rig of the prize. Ten thousand pound. <laughs> Just a moment. Oh, <laughs> bless you. Thank you, miss. Excuse me, miss. Can your father be taking breakfast with you? Oh, I do hope so, Emily. We have so much to discuss. This was found scientific research to what I could hardly have credited before I went away. Though when he gets in his laboratory, I fancy it will take more than breakfast with his daughter to prize him out. If you hadn't returned this week, Professor, my experiments would have come to a standstill. Oh, that's of little importance now. This is what we must concentrate upon. Any means at our disposal. Fantastic, isn't it? Note the difference between these two skulls. Neanderthal man, primitive, ape-like. They had very, very small brain cavities. Now compare that with this new specimen. Far greater brain capacity. You may inform my father that breakfast is ready, Emily. Yes, miss. Sir? Breakfast is ready now, sir. Hmm? Breakfast, sir. Oh, no, no, Martha. Not just now. Not now. I've been extremely busy. Hmm. Please, miss, your father says he's busy at the moment. Very well. Perhaps you would ask him again in a few minutes. Yes, miss. Thank you. The strange thing is that I found this skeleton in these rocks here. Whereas the remains of Neanderthal man, which I found on my previous expedition, were in this lair here. Therefore, this new skeleton must be much older than the Neanderthal. Yes. Anything else? But the new one seems to be more advanced. Why, exactly, Waterloo. Which means all our theories of evolution are turned upside down. My discovery proves that there was advanced, intelligent life on Earth far earlier than it has been thought. This is the link that scientists have been searching for. They come in. This will revolutionize scientific thinking, Waterloo. Please excuse me, sir. Miss Penelope sent me especially to ask, would you please come and take breakfast with her? Oh, why, yes, yes, of course. Tell her I will join her directly. I'm sorry to have been so long. I'll get you your breakfast. You look after me so well. I'd like to hear what you've been doing during my absence abroad. I trust you have not neglected your music lessons while I've been away. Oh, no, Father. And uh, just tea, thank you. And all the domestic arrangements have proved satisfactory? I had to dismiss two of the servants, as you may have noticed. Oh, yes, um, Martha and, uh, oh, why, my dear? We can't afford them, Father. It's been so hard these last 12 months making ends meet, saving pennies here, pennies there. It's been such a strain. What would I do without you, Penelope? Ever since your dear mother died, you've been everything to me. But you won't have to worry any more. This time, my discoveries will bear fruit, I promise you. What is it? You're not unwell? Oh, no, Father. I'll, I'll be all right. Are you sure? Yes, Father. Perhaps you spent too long alone in this house. Now that I'm back, you'll be able to go out again. The two of us together. Just as soon as I've completed my present work. Yes, Father. Excuse me. My dear brother, although this letter will not reach you until your return, I unhappily write to inform you that your wife passed away this morning. Needless to say, I have respected your wishes and have not informed Penelope. Is something wrong, Father? 
Nothing that needs concern you, my child. Oh, good afternoon, sir. Drive on, coachman. Get up there. Naturally, I'm very sorry, Emmanuel, but we must treat your wife's death as a merciful release for you both. There was no improvement towards the end, no. I'm afraid not. We had to continue treatment until the last. Won't you come in? Thank you. Of course, during your absence, we made the appropriate funeral arrangements. Marguerite is buried here in the cemetery, should you wish to visit the grave. Thank you. And Penelope? How is she? I do not imagine she will be unduly disturbed by all this because she has believed her mother to be dead for many years. When are you going to tell her the truth, Emmanuel? I can't. You know I can't. What do you mean? For so long it's been on my mind that her mother's illness might be hereditary, that it might recur in Penelope. James, you're the authority in this field. Is such a thing possible, or am I worrying needlessly? Very soon I hope to be able to answer that. The answers, and many others, will be in this manuscript when it is published. I'm entering it for the Richter Prize. The Richter Prize? Yes, Emmanuel. Things have changed. It was always you who was destined for great success, whereas I was only the poor, hard-working half-brother whom you had to put up with. Now it is I who am the success. I intend to win that prize, Emmanuel, and the prestige that goes with it. Now, if you will excuse me, I have many matters to attend to. Oh, yes, uh, your wife's uh, documents, committal papers, death certificate, etc., etc., you will find them all in order. Very great. Uh, one moment. I want to make it quite clear, Emmanuel, that I do not propose to continue to subsidize your ridiculous expeditions to the ends of the earth to prove your lunatic theories about the origin of man. Good day. Then he's escaped, sir. Escaped? He smashed the door down, knocked the guard out and got clean away, sir. The lock must have been... Well, get after him, man. Sound the alarm. of that sort of literature. Where did you get it? You have not been out? No, father. I haven't left the house since you were away except to walk in the garden. Then how did you come by this magazine? I found it on a bookshelf. I thought it must have been one of mother's. Your mother's? But I have forbidden you. Yes, father. You have forbidden me to talk about my mother or to mention her name or to enter her room. 
Don't you understand? I never knew my mother. She died when I was too young to know her. I just thought by reading something that she... My had... dear child, my every thought is, is for your welfare. You are my beloved responsibility. I've tried to keep from you anything which might cause you distress. I'm, I'm so sorry if I failed. I love you, Father, but I must know about Mother. Can you lock away memories just by locking her room? You must trust me. I do know what is best. Both of us. Well, my dear fiends, enjoying the film so far? Mm -hmm. Who wouldn't? I mean, with those wonderful actors, Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing, together uh, making this wonderful, wonderful film, this thriller, this chiller, this creeper. <laughs> well, you know, Peter Cushing is, uh, was a wonderful actor and, and man and creature and, and uh, monster all in his own right. I mean, if you haven't looked him up or found any of his autobiographies, which are two, by the way, he wrote himself, uh, you should, should pick them up because they're well worth the read. And let me put these, my reading glasses on here and let's just learn a little bit about uh, Mr. Peter Wilton Cushing. He was born oh, Peter Wilton Cushing OBE. He, he got a, 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 a status there uh, along the way. Uh, he was born May 26, 1913. He died August 11th, 1994. He was uh, 88 years old, I believe it was. Uh, he was an English actor. His acting career spanned over six decades and included appearances in more than 100 films, as well as many television, stage, and radio performances. He uh, achieved recognition for his leading performances in the Hammer Productions horror films from the 1950s to the 1970s, and as Grand Moff Tarkin in Star Wars, 1977. Woohoo! Um, he was married to Violet Helene Beck. Uh, he called her Helen. Um, they were married from 1943 till 1971 when she died. And in fact, some of the uh, films uh, are around that period before she died. You may have noticed that uh, Peter picked up a lot of uh, work in uh, lower budget films. Well, he was doing this to pay for his beloved wife's uh, medical uh, bills and, and uh, tr trying to get her recouped uh, and brought back to her health. Well, let's see. Cushing gained worldwide fame for his appearances in 22 horror films from the Hammer Studio, particularly for his role as Baron Frankenstein in six of the seven Frankenstein films and Dr. Van Helsing in five Dracula films. Cushing often appeared alongside actor Christopher Lee, who became one of his closest friends, and occasionally with the American horror star uh, Vincent Price. <laughs> and of course, we can't forget John Carradine. Carradine was, uh, as, was in there as well. Hmm. Well, that's just a little tidbit about Peter Cushing. And honestly, go out and buy the biography or the autobiographies. And there's so much more to this fellow than, than what I've just read off here. Hmm? Okay, let's go back to tonight's feature, The Creeping Flesh. <laughs>
continue with the experiment, Doctor. We'll discuss the conclusions later. Oh, uh, good evening, Dr. Hilda. Give me the keys. I want to see how Lenny escaped. Do you think you ought to go in there, sir? You'd better take this, sir. this on Lenny. Let's hope we find him before he goes berserk again. Good morning. Morning, sir. Thank you. Carry straight on here. And keep your eyes skinned as you go through those trees. Dear, what a mess. Try to clean it, Professor. Hurry! I'm afraid there's no trace of this Linny man in the local area, sir. He might have headed for London. It would help us if we could have a more detailed description of the man, sir. If that's not too much trouble. Of course not, officer. Every one of my patients here is fully documented. Well, here we are. This is the most recent photograph we have of the man. You may keep it if you wish. Oh, thank you, sir. We'll do our best. Well, I only hope your best is good enough, officer. Look at this. 
The morning paper. This institute can do without a scandal of this kind. Well, sir, if I might venture to point out, are you sure your security arrangements are satisfactory? Perfectly satisfactory. I inspected them myself only last night. Oh, thank you, sir. And good day. I thought I'd examine the structure of the flesh tissue. Yes. Can I help you, Professor? I cannot find my volumes on folklore of the New Guinea primitives. I was looking for them last night. Have you seen them? Miss Penelope recatalogued the library while you were away. The particular books you want are in the drawing room bookcase. Ah, be a good fellow. Get it for me, will you? Certainly. Yeah. Oh, I return the keys to you, Professor. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, there it is. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Oh, excuse Waterloo. me, Miss Penelope. Those volumes on the New Guinea primitives, your father wants them. Now, let me see. Folklore. Let me help you. Thank you. There you are. Thank you. Now, listen to this in relation to what happened last night when I was cleaning the skeleton. It's about the primitive people of New Guinea today who believe that their ancestors were a race of giants who carried on a titanic war between good and evil when the world was created. When the evil one shall be exposed, the Sky Father shall weep. Weep, Waterloo. That means rain, water. Weep for the departure of paradise from the earth. And his tears Water again, do you see? His tears, falling upon the evil one, will give him life. Now that is precisely what happened last night, here in this room. And so the battle between good and evil will continue on the earth. Well, I really don't understand. It all seems rather difficult. Don't you see the parallel? In the normal course of erosion, this skeleton would be exposed on the surface in approximately 3,000 years. By which time, the people of New Guinea should have developed a state of scientific knowledge equivalent to ours. And then, the Sky Father will weep. Rain, Waterloo. Rain, water. And last night, I anticipated that process by 3,000 years. Why, I am the white god. I alone hold this tremendous power of good and evil in my hands. If I can control this power, what opportunities are open for humanity? I, with this knowledge, I could, I could wipe evil away from the world. It could be abolished forever. We could have a new paradise here on Earth. It's uh, food for thought. Hey, Waterloo. Outwardly, the flesh looks quite human. But let us look further.
living blood cells, but not ordinary cells. Uh, let's have a look at some of mine. Now, these ordinary human blood cells are completely different, of course. Now, let's see what happens when we mix the two. A little bit of mine and a little bit of his. Now, mix them together. Now, Penelope, I want you to be a good little girl and promise me that you will not go into your mother's room. I miss her so much. When will Mummy be home, Daddy? I do want to see her again. Since evil is a disease, it could therefore be possible to immunize man by some form of inoculation. Good, yes, that'll do. Now, theoretically, Waterlow, if a minute quantity of evil serum were introduced into the bloodstream of an individual, that individual should be proof against contamination by the evils of this world for the rest of his or her life. We must prepare a serum from the evil cells and put it to a practical test. I don't want your mother's room disturbed. I want her to find it just as she left it.
Dear Penelope, you are everything to me. And since your mother's death when you were so young, I've tried to be everything to you. My every thought has been for you. You must trust me. I do know what is best for both of us. I prepared a sample of the monkey's blood, Professor. Splendid. Yes. That should have been time enough. Thank you. The serum has formed a protective film around each cell. Now, the question is... Can this protection withstand the forces of undiluted evil? Withstand an attack from the blood taken from the newly formed flesh? I wonder. It can. So far, success, Waterloo. Congratulations, Professor. A new day is dawning for mankind. We'll continue in the morning. Good night, Professor. Good night. This is your mother's room. How dare you? How could you do such a thing? How dare you? Why didn't you tell me about her? Why? You said she was dead. Why? It Why? was your own good. Your own good. All the time. All the time you kept the memory of her alive up here in this room. You never loved me. You never loved your own daughter. You had room only in your heart for her. You never had any left for me. But all the time she was a prisoner. Like me. Why didn't you let me see her? Why? You want everybody to be a prisoner. You wanted her kept a prisoner, locked up in that dreadful place. I am nothing to you.
No, no, not Penelope. I won't let it happen to her. with you. Perhaps I should have told you about your mother. I wanted to protect you. I thought it was for the best. anywhere. I can deal with most brawlers myself, but this bloke was a madman. Well, even old Len Gaskell here, he was hiding behind the bar. But it takes a lot to shake old Len. Look at it. I see. Come on, get this place cleared up. Oh, my God. Professor. Professor! What's the matter? Come down here quickly! Please come quickly, sir. What's wrong, man? What's the matter? The serum. Oh, God. Thank God we didn't use it on a human being. Penelope? We've traced Lenny, sir, to the east end of London. We think he's still there. It'd be advisable if we could take a couple of your staff with us. Very well. Send the security coach and give the inspector all the help he requires. Yes, sir. Oh, one other point, sir. In view of this man's violent nature, I can't guarantee to bring him back alive. 
Just bring him back, Inspector. Sir. Otherwise, I'm going to call a cop. I've had trouble with your sort before. It's for the gin, ma'am, Lord. And for another. The young lady is with me. Having a very good evening, eh? Perhaps I can brighten it up a little. Oh, come, come, my dear. We don't put our goods on display unless they're for sale, do we? It's m my mother's dress. <laughs> I like that. It's very good. We'd better go upstairs and test the quality of the material, eh? Landlord, we're going upstairs. All right, sir. You know the way. Pretending, aren't we? <laughs> so, you keep up the pretense even here, do you? Very well. It's time you learned a thing or two. <laughs>
Championship? When I want that sort of thing, I'll ask. <laughs> Get back now, all together, right! <laughs> 
sign of her. No. Can I do anything while you rest? No. No, no, you'd best go home, Mortimer. I'll send a message if I need you. But thank you so much for waiting. Results. No apparent reaction. It's impossible to tell whether these lights have any effect at all. Could we be on the wrong track with your electrical wave theory? No, no, I'm convinced I'm right. We've got to make a breakthrough. The experiments on the patients prove nothing. They're already insane. And until you can artificially cause insanity, you can prove nothing. Well, unfortunately, in the state of society as it exists today, we are not permitted to experiment on human beings. Normal human beings. (laughs) 
Lenny's dead, sir. There was a woman with him. They brought her here. I've taken a blood test from her. I'd like you to see it. Won't it wait? I think you'd better look at it now, sir. Oh, very well. might be hereditary, that it might recur in Penelope. Is such a thing possible, or am I worrying needlessly? Unfortunately, in the state of society as it exists today, we are not permitted to experiment on human beings, nor human beings. Get her inside, quickly. Take her upstairs. Yes, sir. Go on, quickly. Yes, sir. Keep her under constant supervision. Yes, sir. Oh, What are you doing in here? Oh, Emmanuel. It would appear that your research is following similar lines to my own. How dare you come spying in my laboratory? There's no reason why we shouldn't pool our resources, is there? What do you mean? Come, come, Emmanuel. There's no need to be so evasive. I happen to know that your experiments have uh, misfired. I don't know what you're talking about. I see you won't listen to reason. Now, I suggest you tell me everything you know. What are those black cells? How do you isolate them? And what association do they have with insanity? I do not know what you're talking about. I must ask you to leave my house immediately. You will have to tell me you know. I could ruin you if the scandal became known. A scandal? Yes, scandal. You would be utterly ruined professionally if it were learnt that you had experimented on your own family. Fortunately for you, however, your daughter was brought to my asylum. Penelope? Where is she now? All right, Penelope. All right, all right. All right. All right. All right. All right. You say that the black cells only appear in the patients who are capable of extreme violence. Yes, I've taken samples from all the patients. That is conclusive. Emmanuel says here that he can only obtain the cells in their pure state from the living tissue formed around the bone. Could that be the bone of the skeleton he talks about? And how do you form living tissue around dead bone? It seems absolute nonsense to me. There's something that he hasn't mentioned in these notes. 
I've got to get hold of that skeleton somehow. Well, I don't know. There is the question of professional ethics. Oh, indeed, indeed. That is why I shall have to employ someone for whom ethics have no significance. Thank you, Professor. Well, my dear fiends, <laughs> did I wake you up? <laughs> I bet I didn't. I bet you were already awake, sitting there with those hands almost covering the eyes. <laughs> what a wonderful film, eh, my dear fiends? Well, you know, speaking of the film, I thought I would have a little fun with it called The Creeping Flesh. And so I went back into our laboratory back in the, the back of Gargoyle Manor here, and uh, I, brought, I brought out some of our own creeping flesh. And uh, of course, you have to have the creeping flesh activator uh, to, to get it started. And of course, you noticed uh, with the creeping flesh and the, a lot of the uh, sci uh, mad science that goes on, they always experiment with the large uh, bodies. Of, of creatures and things, you know, and they, they, that's fine and dandy, but you know, they're very hard to, uh, to control. So I thought I would just go out and make 
I find a little smaller skeleton to work with and see, see what would happen with that. But first, we have the creeping flesh and we have to take the activator and we have to, uh, well, we have to activate it. <laughs> and so we do it like this. Whoa, yep, it's getting there. Whoa. Well, yes, indeed, I think that would about activate it really well. I think, yes, I, I, I pulled my activator uh, tongue off here. How about one more time? One more time. All right. Okay, that's good enough. Good enough. It's activated indeed. We'll set that right over there. Ah, yes, indeed. Now, now let's see. Let's get it out. Oh, here it comes. It's slow. It's a little bit slow, but ah, there we go. Ah, excellent, excellent. I got to, okay, just switch it over. Now, we have to sort of get it started over the top of the uh, skeleton like this. It looks like he's got a wig on, doesn't it, a little bit there. Ah. <laughs> so anyway, let's, uh, let's get him started. There he goes. Okay, now we got to let it, you know, dribble down. He's kind of slow, but it's well, well, well worth the wait. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Practice that in the mirror well worth the wait uh, several times and there it goes ah, it's covering covering the facial and the, the cranium and the shoulders now it's coming down and we'll help it with a little bit with draping it over the arms and of course the uh, hands and we'll go over here he'll have to kind of help the creeping flesh a little bit because you know it doesn't seem to have directions ah, there it goes oops it's coming down it's coming down oh yes indeed yes indeed and of course we want to come over whoops it's not quite lapped up it keeps wanting to let go i ain't gone here now now it's 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 creeping really well and it looks like it's covering the uh the skeleton very nicely <laughs> now isn't that fun you know you can have a a lot of fun with mad science like this <laughs> And so while it's still creeping and doing the oozing part, doesn't that make your cr flesh just crawl and creep? <laughs> well, my dear fiends, let's go back to tonight's feature, The Creeping Flesh, starring Peter Cushing and Sir Christopher Lee. <laughs> Indeed, that is so much fun. Now we've got to clean it up.
Where is he, Gus? There's been an accident. What's happened? Don't ask questions. I'll explain on the way. Hurry up!
This creature walks upon the earth. Mankind will be engulfed in great disasters. Wars, killing on a far greater scale than ever before. The pestilence of evil is spreading. I alone can save the world. You're going? You're not going to help me? We are helping you, Professor. That's what we're here for. Yes, I agree with you entirely, Dr. Hilden. He's completely insane. The most amazing fantasies. They even involve you. He thinks you're his half-brother. Well, that's quite normal in these cases. I'm a sort of authority figure for them, so naturally I appear in their fantasies. The poor fellow even believes that this patient is his daughter. How long has he been here? Oh, uh, three years, I think. Yes, three years. The year I won the Richter Prize. Hopeless case, I'm afraid. Help me! 
help me. Please help me. Well, Boris, what did you think about that ending, huh? <laughs> I know it was a, uh, a type of ending where, you know, uh, monsters could love and hate at the same time. I mean, think about it. I mean, of course, we had Christopher Lee came up out on top and uh, had his half-brother, Peter, put into the uh, insane asylum. Of course, he said he didn't even know who he was, along with his niece as well. And of course, he inherited all of that property and he got to have that award. And of course, then again, Peter, who started it all with the finding the, uh, the creature from the, uh, from the uh, jungle there and, and bringing it back and bringing it to life by accident and starting all this calamity. You know, he, he should have had a little bit more reward than that, but yet eh, he may be comfortable in, in, the, uh, in the insane asylum for a while. But the best of all is that the monster itself, the creature, got to live got to go out and who knows what sort of uh, chicanery it got up to after that. I mean, it may even still be going on today. I mean, <laughs> look around at things that's happening in our lifetime, eh, my dear fiends? <laughs> Who's to say that that creature isn't out there uh, perhaps taking a different disguise? Who knows? <laughs> I'm not going to venture a guest. Are you, Boris? <laughs> no. Well, my dear fiends, we hope that you enjoyed this week's uh, entourage of actors and creatures and creeps and uh, we hope that your flesh is still creeping up and down. Mm? <laughs> well, until next time, as always, <laughs> keep screaming.